to the book of Luke, chapter number 15. I've been wanting to preach this message for a long time, and tonight I'm going to try to do it by the help of the Lord. Everybody listen carefully, I'm going to tell you all these great stories in the Bible. This morning, I just preached on why a person needs to get right. Sometimes I preach well, the great stories of the Bible, and I'm going to do that tonight. Luke chapter number 15. Amen. Everybody look at it. Verse number 11. This has been called the Prince of Parables. This has been called some of the greatest literature in the world. I'm getting ready to read to you tonight. And it's a great story and has all the elements of home and family and... and uh, Reconciliation and jealousy and everything right in this story. Hollywood gets all their ideas from movies uh, from the Bible and the Lord. Uh, I've heard Dr. Ruckman say there's only 33 original plots. Only 33 original plots. And all movies are made from one of those 33 plots and every one of them is in the King James Bible. Uh, jealousy, pride, murder, lust, adultery, all the things that Hollywood makes movies of it's all right here in the Bible. Just a cheap imitation of the Word of God. And they don't like the Bible because the Bible puts it in a holy context. They take the sinful part and glorify it. But God chose it the other way. Here in Luke chapter number 15, look at verse 11. And He said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. And they began to be merry. I preach tonight on the subject, the prodigal son. You know, times have changed, but people have not changed. We, th we see this same scenario repeated hundreds and hundreds of times in our lives today. Teenagers hadn't changed. This is the perfect story. Nowadays, there is a definite, definite gap between the older generation and the younger generation. This is a story that tells about a young man who grew up and went probably thought he knew everything. And he thought he knew more than his mom and his daddy. And he ran away from home and wasted everything he had. And then he wound up realizing that he'd made a terrible mistake. And he winds up coming back home, making things right with his father. And that's the great story of the prodigal son. So many pictures of that in our society uh, tonight. So many times that people, uh, boys or girls, run away, leave home, and, and then wind up getting in a mess, and wind up getting their heart broke, and wind up in their way back home to God and to their, to their father. And I want to talk about that tonight. And um, I want to set a little stage here in your mind. If you'll give me attention just for a few minutes. Uh, put this picture in your mind. Now, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a Bible story, and I'm going to use it in illustration in a way that you can understand it. I picture this home. It might not have been like this. But I picture this man was a very, very well-off man. He lived, maybe, up on a big old hill in one of these uh, log cabin style big homes. I like to call it the Ponderosa. And boy, he lived up on big old pine trees uh, up in his yard. I mean, it was way out there in the country. And they had it made. He had two sons, a younger son and one uh, a, a few years older than him. Now imagine, them boys worked every day. They knew that one of these days daddy was going to be gone and they was going to inherit all his houses and land. And They knew that. And uh, they, it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful place. Uh, maybe it was little Joe and Hoss. And uh, uh, the little Joe was the one I'm going to preach about tonight. And, and they come in at night and boy, there was a big old fireplace. Like that place, you know, up there in Hiawassee this weekend, uh, they put me, and it was uh, me and, and Tim and uh, Brother Mike here, they put us in a place, buddy. We had a brand new, spanking new, brand new log cabin. When you walked in, you could smell that wood. It had four full bathrooms, four full, I mean, two full kitchens. Ten or twelve people could have stayed there. We ha I had my own room with one of them big old beds, and it had big logs on the bedpost like this. Everything was decorated with bears, bears on the wall, and pictures of pine cones. So I to that being like that, right behind us was a lake. Uh, with a dock and a sliding board down the water. And right, I mean, it was beautiful. I had my own kajusi right in my own bathroom. And boy, I mean, and we have six TVs in that thing, I believe it was. Oh, it was unbelievable. And I picture this home, two fireplaces. I imagine they'd put them big old logs on the fire at night. And, and, uh, and old man, he would sit down like this, you know. And he'd sit down and say, boys, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, what y'all do today? And they fans said, uh, Fed the horses all. And uh, that's about all they did is feed them horses and cows. And you know, uh, once an old hop scene come in every now and then. I reckon, uh, and he said, I'll get you something, Mr. Ben. Uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, fried chicken, boy. They'd sit down at the table every night and have fried chicken, biscuits, and gravy. A lot of people think that biscuits and gravy is just breakfast food. But you ain't never had no supper like fried chicken and biscuits and gravy for supper. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Pork chops, see the one. But boy, biscuits and gravy is good. Hopsine had to learn all that stuff when he come here uh, to to or went there uh, to, to Jerusalem, and uh, uh, they imported him from China. And boy, I'm telling you, I, I've got ancient Jerusalem, modern day America, and Bonanza and China all mixed up in this story. Uh, but anyway, uh, boy, I, you they had it made. Big old log fire at night. They'd sit there like this, and buddy, they they would uh, they would they'd sit around the fire at night. And the horse would sit there, and he'd say, Paul, he said, I got them cattle branded today. Got every one of them done. And he said, that's good, son. But little Joe, you know, uh, little Joe had a little problem. And little Joe, somehow or another, now, if it was nowadays, I'm going to tell you how it'd be, but back in those days, it might have been a traveling salesman. And this traveling salesman comes through one time, and he said, uh, he left Joe some magazines. And little Joe kept him magazines and it told about what was going on out there in the far country. You see, when they was growing up, they didn't know there was such a thing. They just went to town twice a year and, you know, they'd go get flour and sugar and, and stuff like that. You know, supplies, they called it. And they'd go down there, but when they was up there in their log cabin, uh, they wouldn't have no with the outside world. No contact whatsoever. But old little Joe, somehow or another, he got a hold of a little old portable radio. And little Joe been there at night, and uh, after his daddy had gone to bed, he'd pull the cover up over his head, and he'd turn that thing on. And he'd go, <laughs> and he'd turn it just a little bit more, and he could hear something going, <laughs> and he thought, what in the world is that? And then a voice he could barely make out said, uh, party, party, party. How oh, we're going to party down at the 99 store this coming Friday night. Ladies, get in free. We got the prettiest ladies in town. A uh, uh, poop doggy dog is going to be there doing that. And boy, we got all of these people here. And little Joe thought, whoa. 
I've never heard of anything like that. They said, we have the pretty ladies. Now see where little Joe lived. They wasn't but about two girls in the town. And, and, they, and one of them was so buck tooth she could eat an apple through a chlink fence. And the other one, the other one was so cross-eyed when she cried, tears run down her back. And, and little Joe, he had never seen a pretty girl. He had never seen a girl with all her teeth. He had never seen a girl whose teeth were white. He thought girls' teeth were brown. And, uh, and he had never seen a girl uh, uh, who had uh, smooth skin. He thought all girls, you know, looked awful. Like them two that lived in his town. And that traveling salesman put him a, put him a uh, magazine there. And boy, he said, whoa, there's really girls that look like that. And it stirred up something down on the inside of this young man. Now you know what happened. We don't have to have traveling salesmen anymore. Uh, we, uh, listen, we got it pumped into our living room. The far country is right in our home now. The far country is in your house nowadays. It ain't like that, like that it used to be. But little Joe got a hunger and he wanted to know what was out there. And listen, teenagers tonight, when you start getting in trouble is when you get in the sixth and seventh and eighth grade and you start wanting to know what's out there. I remember when I was a little kid and I had a little radio. And I remember... That that song, Pretty Woman, had just came out. It had been out for a few years. And it reminded me, I always played it. And I remember, I remember, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 years old. And I remember taking that little radio in my bedroom and I turned it on and I turned it with... And then I heard that... And I heard that. I didn't really like old Roy's voice, but I liked that guitar. And I remember listening to that song. I liked the way that guitar sang. Pretty woman walking down the street. Pretty woman, the one I like to meet. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't boast true. No one could look as good as you. And you know, I remember as a 12, 9, 10, 11 years old, that put something in me, and I started wanting to know what was out there. How many of y'all can remember stuff like that happening when you was growing up? You remember a TV show? You remember a movie you watched? Inside, there's something said, wow, I'd like to go there. I'd like to see that. Amen. That's why you went to a rock concert. That's why you went to a dance at school. You wanted to, that far country. It's normal for young people to want to know what's out there. But it'll get you in more trouble than you'll get out of. This young man lost everything that he had because he wanted to know what was out there. Listen, that's why the Bible said be wise concerning good and simple concerning evil. You don't have to know what's out there. You don't have to know every dirty, rotten, lame thing that's out there. I get sick and tired of people saying, well, these kids in a Christian school, they're sheltered too much. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Thank God they don't have to know ever perverted, low down, wicked, ungodly, twisted thing that's going on out there in this world. People say, well, if you don't let them know what's going on, when they get in the real world, they won't be able to handle it. They don't ever need to be in them perverted places. They don't ever need to see that stuff. They're better off never to know it. But old little Joe, he would listen night after night. And then one day, he began to be hungry for the world. And he's got a hunger for the world. Once you get bit by that thing, that hunger for that world will overtake you if you ain't careful. You teenagers and young people, young men and women in here tonight, this world's got a lot of stuff to offer you. And boy, it'll put it on there and it'll, that TV will make you think TV is one of the worst curses that's ever been on this planet. It make all it does is make you want stuff that you can't have, and it makes you want something that don't even exist. They put them people on there. I mean, the good-looking guy, the pretty girl, they kiss. Always a fire burning. Uh, the music's a playing. Everything's perfect. Listen, brother, it presents a side of sin that does not exist. It does not exist. It's never that way. That girl, uh, that girl in real life. I mean, winds up slapping around. She gets pregnant trouble hey, with the law and everything else. And Joe got a taste of that tonight. And so, as, as old boy, I want to say several things about him. And the first thing I want to say is we see a selfish demand. Like many young people today, he wanted what he had coming to him right there. He had an itch for the instantaneous. He did not want to wait for nothing. The great folly of sinners is that they are content to have their portion in this life. They are tired of the Father's government. His pride and independence took over. And boy, the next thing you know, he was... He said, I'm not going to spend my life sitting around here working 
stupid farm and waiting on daddy to die and marrying old Bucktooth down here and, and raising kids and living on this farm all my life. I want to go where the big lights, uh, the big city, the light lights. I want to, I want to, I go to a party. I want to go to that thing that man was talking about on the radio the other night. I want to go down to Charlotte. I want to go down to uh, Myrtle Beach. I want to go. That's what old Joe did. And boy, Joe went to his daddy one day. He said, Daddy, I don't know whether you die. I'm not nothing personal. But he said, Daddy, I'd like to have my inheritance right now. He said, let my brother Hoss have it when uh, the rest of it when you're gone. But I want mine right now. He had a selfish demand. You are getting in trouble. You listen to me? You're getting in trouble when you start thinking about me, me, me. I, I, I. I had a lady tell me one time. She said, I'm leaving my husband. And I said, why? She said, I'm sick of living for other people. She said, I've lived for other people my whole life. It's about time I live for me. I said, you're making the biggest mistake that you'll ever make in your life. You're not supposed to live for yourself. You're supposed to live for other people. And God will bless you. But no, sir. He had to have it His way. He had to have what He wanted. He wanted. And a young man always gets trouble when he says, I want this, I want this, and I want it now, and I'm not willing to Way. He had a selfish demand. And sure enough, his daddy gave it to him. Secondly tonight, he had a wayward journey. In verse 13, it said, not many days after. The younger. Now, something about a younger son or a younger daughter, they always think they know everything. They always think nobody can tell them nothing. They get about 13, 14, 15, 16. That my, oh, Lord. Some of you 15-year-olds in here tonight, you're going to be surprised how smart your daddy gets by the time you're 25. Uh, realize he knew what he's talking about all along and we tried to tell you we tried to tell you but you would not listen and so that old boy took a wayward journey he took a wayward journey and the bible said he gathered all together and he headed out now so like this i don't know how much money he got but he got a lot he got all his and money his brother was going to have to wait on uh, daddy to die and get land and how so he got his in cash he went down there and had it deposited in the bank he had all his money in the bank, got him an ATM card, and the first thing he did when he got his money, the first thing he did is went right straight down to the camel lot and picked him out a brand new oh, 03, year 3, uh, camel. And boy, that just came out. It was, it was, uh, it was, uh, about BC3 or something like that. Uh, BC3 camels had just came out. They had them all lined up down there in the, in, on the, in the road. He went down there and the old hellsman come out. He said, well, we just got these in right here. This baby right here has got, got about ten miles on her. And he said, buddy, I'll tell you what. He said, I want the most expensive one you got. He said, where'd you get this money, boy? You're eight. Don't worry about it. I got my card right here. Paying cash for it. He bought him a camel. Soon as he got that camel, he took it downtown to the detail shop, Extreme Machine. And boy, he went to work on that thing. He put a system in that thing. It wouldn't quit. He put speakers in that thing about that big. And boy, I'm telling you, he put them, tied them on the back of that camel that set of saddlebags. He had speakers. And boy, he'd punch that CD player and it'd be... Boom. You could hear him hype a mile before you come around the curve. I mean, have you ever, hadn't you ever pulled up to a red light and you could hear boom, 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 boom. That's the way it was. He had the baddest camel. I mean, he, he put, he put chrome little swing on them, on them hooves. He shined them things up with armor all. He went down there and had that thing's eyes tinted. I mean, I tell you what, boy, he, he, he hung him a do-rag on his ears, on the ears of that thing. Yes, sir, brother. That's all in the Greek, you dumb, educated, uneducated people don't know. I'll tell you something, brother. I mean, he put that do-rag on the ears of that baby, and here he comes. When he put his foot a break, his initials showed up in the tail lights. How's that for cool? I mean, buddy, he had him a personalized tag right on that camel rear end. It said, Lil Joe. Uh, Lil Joe. And boy, I'll tell you what, here he come. He went and bought him not, I mean, he had him a $75 pair of jeans and bought him a big Hollister shirt. And boy, I mean, oh boy, he was the toughest guy in town. His shirt was about eight sizes too little for it. And you could see that one little muscle popping up right there. Like that right there. Uh, when he did that, he come into town, that little bird chest, and boy, here he come on his brand new camel. And buddy, I'm telling you, he was the baddest boy in town. He 
he got down to the down to Charlotte, and boy, he went down, and everybody says, "Nice car, nice car, nice camel." Hiya, big boy. Nice camel. And he said, uh, you look pretty good yourself there, uh, sweetheart. You want to ride? She said, yeah. He said, hop on. She hopped on the back of his camel. Uh, she hopped on the back of it. And boy, they went coming through town like they have the Arab. Bless God. Amen. I tell you what, that down too cool us tonight. But back in them days, he was he had a bad ride. I ain't kidding you. I mean, he's like my Uncle Tom. My Uncle Tom up in West Virginia. Uncle Tom up in West Virginia said he always wanted to ride his... his his horse in a bar, and sure enough, several years ago, some of my family's up there. He rides a horse downtown and rides it right into the bar and orders him something to drink up in Kermit, West Virginia. Y'all don't believe that? That's true. Somebody asked, and they said, "Tom, Uncle Tom Castle, my daddy's brother." And they said, "Tom, how did he go in there?" And he said, "He's about like my dad. He told old junk all the time." He said, "Well, it did pretty good till they put a quarter in the jukebox and my horse started dancing." <laughs> I don't believe that part. Uh, but he really did. He really did ride his horse into the bar. And buddy, I'll tell you what, that's the way the old boy did. Little Joe come to town. He come into town, boy. He rode that thing around the bar, tied it up outside, grabbed his sweetie by the hand, and here they went in. And boy, the lights was going around like this, and they was going around, and they started dancing. He didn't know how to dance. On his cowboy boots and his hat. And boy, she started all these moves and stuff. And he went, Never seen nobody do that. Lord, you look like a snake, girl. And, uh, and she's acting like a snake. And boy, he, he, he tried it a little bit. And he stumbled around there and everything. And people was laughing. Like, Who's the cowboy? He's back in the future or something. Uh, you know, uh, you know, back the blast from the past or whatever it is. And boy, here he is, this fool here, dancing around here. And boy, they made fun of him. And little Joe said, the drinks are on me. And boy, he had more friends than he knew what to do with because he had money. You know, when you go out there and you're in the night, you buy money and buy the car you got all kinds of friends. But when your money's gone, your car's gone, your friends is gone, and they wouldn't give you air in a jug. Amen? I mean, that dope dealer likes you as long as you can bring that money in there. They're your friends as long as you'll party and get high with them. But when you're down in the ditch and you're in jail and in trouble, you can't find them with the FBI. I'm telling you, brother, he wasted his substance with riotous living. He went downtown and rented him the most expensive penthouse apartment in town. I mean, it was... I mean, had a, had a plasma TV about as big as that sign on, on the wall. And boy, I'm telling you, had a system in there. I mean, had a swimming pool. Had everything. He had parties every night. And the Bible said he wasted it. He wasted it. Hey, man, I'm telling you tonight, young people, you can go out and you think, I'll party and live it up. I'll live like them people on MTV. The devil has paid them fools off. The devil has blessed them with all that money and they present that life in front of you and you think you can live like that. But it don't work. It never works. It never works. It never works. Sin never works out. Sin never makes you better. It always brings you down and gets you in trouble. You kids don't need to watch MTV Cribs to get your lifestyle habits. Every time I hear one of you kids say something like he's pimped out or pimping like I want to slap your jaw. Pimp is a dirty, low-down word. I'd rather you say S.O.B. than pimp. Wash dirty mouth out. S.O.B. is a clean word side pimp. Amen. I'm sick of hearing it. There's old brothers on those days. I was real dressed up one day. And somebody said, Brother Danny's pimp out. Don't you dare call me that. You know what a pimp will do? A pimp will take your little sister and sell her like a piece of meat to a bunch of low-down dogs that will rip her guts out and rape her and kill her. A pimp is the most low-down scum on earth. Say amen right there. A pimp is what you say, boy, that I'm pimping. I wouldn't tell nobody. You'd be better off to sell cocaine or you'd be better off to be a terrorist than a pimp. A terrorist will have less to answer for than a pimp will. Sorry, low down big chicken. Sorry, too sorry to work. And they'll lay up there in an apartment wear their yellow suits and pink suits and all that and make them little girls get out there and sell their self for them and then bring them the money. That's as sorry as you could get. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Amen. Listen, brother, that old boy, he, little Joe, run into all that stuff. And you'll run into all that stuff out there in this world. Amen. 
He had wasted his substance with riotous living. And then we see number four, a miserable condition. It always happens. Some of you right now may be wasting your substance with riotous living. I know what's coming next. A miserable condition. For you see, after they partied about a year at the house, he went down to the bank one day, and he walked in, they all knew him. Hey, Joe, how are you? Joe, how are you doing? He laid down his card and said, I need a couple thousand, we're going to have a party tomorrow night. And the lady handed it back to him and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. You don't have that much in your account. He said, there must be some mistake. i got plenty of money. Lay my card down and check it again. She checked it again and said, sorry, you only have $30. He said, $30? Got to be a mistake. Check your record. He made them go back through the records. He made them give them all you see. They said, see here, sir, you spent this. See here, sir, you spent this. You know, when you're in sin, you don't realize how much money you're spending. That's why kids run up cell phones bills so high and and, and, and I've seen them run up there, call them 900 numbers and, and the cable TV and the pay-per-view and stuff like that. They don't even know how much money you're spending when you're sinning. Sin, sin is expensive. Sin costs you, buddy. You think the devil's going to give it to you free? You're crazy! He'll charge you. He didn't have nothing. And he walked out there and the man come and said, you got it payment due this weekend. Where's the money? He said, I ain't got it. He said, well, you got to be out and got evicted. And then somebody saw his camel sitting down town with a for sale sign clipped on his ear. Ain't that Joe's camel? Well, he must have went and bought him a new one. Uh-uh, I see him hitchhiking to work this morning. And he began to be walked. You listening to me, young people? That Jesus told this story for me to tell it to you tonight. He hit bottom. He hit rock bottom. I don't care how high you get. I don't care how high you go. How popular you get. It'll always get you down. And you'll hit bottom one of these days. You'll hit bottom. And brother, the Bible said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. The Bible said, By means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. You know what a whore will do for you, boys? Make you lose everything you've got. Everything you've got. Including your health. You'll waste all your money. You'll lose your car. Listen, I know people right now that's made good money. Good money. Some of them make ten, a thousand, twelve hundred dollars a week and ain't got one thing to show for it. Not one thing. Sin costs them every bit of it. Don't you know people like that? You know people? I know people that could be rich. Some everything they've ever made. They've wasted every dime they've ever made shooting it, putting it up their nose or shooting it in their veins or partying or getting drunk or on something that's wicked. It was a miserable condition. And what he did, he had to go give him a job. He's a full-time partier! And he said, i got to go find me a job. And he looked in the paper and looked in the paper and looked in the paper and looked in the paper and, he, and you had to have qualifications that he didn't have. And he's a Jew, and he uh, he looked and he said, "Needed young man to slop hog. Apply at six 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 six. He called up and said, "Don't turn it up. Just move my antennas a little bit, and I'll use this one if he keeps doing that." He said, "I'm gonna apply for that job." He said he went down there and that man said, Son, you ever fed hogs? He said, No, I've never touched a hog. I'm Jewish. We hate pigs. Pigs are an abomination. The lowest, low down, it'd be like me and you going to work uh, filling it with a sewer, brother, having to shovel sewage. That's the way it would be for us. It'd be the same thing as you getting a job at the sewer plant, shoveling sewage, raw sewage with a shovel all day. That's how they hated pigs. And he sold his camel, paid his rent, and then they come down there, scoop that thing over, brother, set it, move it over or something, do, just keep fiddling with it. Don't look down, no more. And you know what? Them old boys looked down at him. And they said, "Joe, what are you going to do now?" And he's down there feeding them pigs, and he's down like this, going. 
feeding the pigs. And got so hungry that he wanted to eat the husk that the swine did eat. Corn husk. His belly hurt so bad that he was about ready to eat corn husk. Couldn't have the corn. The pig, the people eat the corn and the pigs eat the husk and he wanted to eat the corn husk. He hit bottom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll say to you tonight, the devil will make you have fun. You'll get way up, but you're going down and you're going down hard and you're going to hit bottom and your belly's going to hurt and you're going to wish to God you'd have never went that way. You wake up in rehab or jail in a miserable condition. He hated pigs. I know some boys from Marion tried them down. And I know these boys from Marion, they said, man, we're going to California. That's where they grow the good stuff. Boy, we're going to smoke that stuff. We're going to live it up. And they, they went to California, and about three weeks later, they come back, and they was about dead. They said, we took every dime we could make. We had an apartment. apartment was like $1,500. And, and they eat potted meat and crackers for two weeks. And buddy, they was back in Marion, thanking God for being a Marion again. The devil will tell you, you can't go out there and live like them people on television. Don't you kid yourself. Listen, you know what they'll do? They'll take you a pit, they'll take a, a, a somebody on TV, they'll take a Christine Aguilera, they'll take a Britney Spears, and they'll make every. wind up a street prostitute having their brains beat out they find them with their throat cut they find them in truck stops and, and we're between trucks laying down there where they're in the pool of their own blood they find them boys over here in Broughton Hospital and stuff we can't even tell you their name they're, you say whatever happened to so and so see the devil don't want you to know what that sin will do to you listen one day, he got up and he went to work. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the Bible said, he came to himself. A light came on in here. Duh! You know what that means? That means anybody that's run away from God and out living in sin tonight is temporarily insane. Ain't in the right mind. Right. Ain't in the right mind. Right. The Bible said he came to himself. So he evidently he was out of it. When you're out there sinning, you ain't thinking straight. And a light came on and he thought, you know what? How many hired servants has my daddy got up there working for him that live in the servants' quarters and they're better off than I am. They get three meals a day. They got a nice warm bed to sleep and they're my daddy's servants. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of this mess and I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. He made a wise decision. I will arise and go to my father. The affliction and won't jarred him to his senses. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. You see, God lets hard times come to us. God lets us fall on our face. God lets to correct us and straighten us up. Get us back on fire. Get us back with God. You know why God let him hit the bottom? Till he'd come to his senses. He lost his camel. He lost his apartment. He lost his inheritance. And he came to himself and he said, my daddy has got people better off and I am. My daddy's, uh, these people up there working for my daddy eight hours a day and they got a lot better life than me. I'm going home to my daddy. I don't know if he'll have me or not. He may kick me out, but I will arise and go to my father. And I'm going to tell you that's what you need to do here tonight. If you're out there living in sin, make up your mind. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in His arms. In the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. And I'm going to tell you something. Finally tonight in closing, we see a gracious reception. He didn't know what was going to happen. We see a picture of the Father's love and forgiveness. I can see it now. All the clothes He's got was just what was on His back. Think about it. He had pig puke maybe stuck on His shirt. He smelt like hogs. 
His hair was matted together. He stunk from not being able to take a bath, living in a pig pen. And here he started toward the Father's house. All he could think of was Hoss up there enjoying the fire and Ben sitting around hop scene waiting on him. He said, I'm going back home. He said, I had it made and didn't know it. I went out here and the devil cheated me and the world took everything I've got. That's what they'll do to you. That's what they'll do to you. You go out there and you think, I don't need the church. I'm sick of Brother Danny trying to cram fast down my throat. I don't want to listen to Mom and Daddy. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do. Yeah, I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll come back broken. You'll come back empty. You'll come back uh, broken hearted and empty handed. Brother, you'll come back uh, wishing to God you'd have never left. I'm telling you, here he come up the road. I can imagine old Ben sitting at home once in a while wondering, what's boy doing? I wonder where he's at. Here he comes. He's walking up that road round them curves. He meets that traveling salesman. Hey, young man, where are you going? He said, I'm going home to the, the, the banana up to Ponderosa. He said, you can't go to the Ponderosa. Look at you. He's all dressed up in a suit and he had his magazine right. Would you like a magazine? No! Stupid things. What got me in this mess? That's right. I want nothing you got to talk about, buddy. I've been down there and found out it ain't what it's cracked up to be. And boy, I'll tell you what, he kept walking and that man said, listen... Them people's nice up there. They live in a mansion. They got plenty of money. You can't go up there looking like that. You better clean up. You better change clothes. You better make yourself comfortable. He said, I ain't got no clean clothes. I ain't got no money to even wash these. He said, I'm just going to go just as I am. Glory to God! Hallelujah! He said, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the house I clean. I ain't got nothing to offer. I can't come make myself presentable. I can't clean up. I'm just going to come just as I am without one plea. That's the way God wants you to come to Him tonight. Just like you are. You don't clean up before you come up. You bring Him all your sins and all your wickedness and all your trouble and just lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. Boy, he come up through there. See, he didn't even know if his daddy was going to take him. For all he knew, his daddy could cuss him out and tell him to get lost. And he said, I don't care if he'll have me or not. I'm leaving this pig in, and I'm going to my father. Amen. Now, there's a perfect illustration of repentance. He didn't call his daddy up and say, Hey, Dad, I'm thinking about coming home. And if you won't put no restrictions on me, and I can come home at whatever time I want to, and I, I might come home and live with you again. <laughs> he said, I'm leaving this mess. He didn't call his dad and say, Dad, will you let me come home? If you ain't, I'm staying here. He said, I'm leaving this mess whether Daddy will let me come home or not. He said, I'm getting out of here. I'm sick of it. That's repentance. That's repentance. You say, you don't bargain with God. You don't make no deals. You don't say, Lord, if you'll let my wife come back, I'll live for you. Lord, if you'll give me a job, I'll live for you. You say, Lord, if she never comes back, if my husband never loves me again, it don't matter if my kid, no matter what, God, I'm coming to you. If you'll have me, here I am. But here, he's, here he come. Here he come. The Bible says, his father. Saw him a great way off. And he looked and he said, Is that my boy? Is that Joe? Joe! Is that you? And when he said that, old Joe, his tears come down his face. He said, it's me, Daddy. It's me. I can see that old man uh, running down off of that porch. And boy, turned around. He said, hop scene. I put on some steak. He said, hoss, your brother's coming home. And old Daddy went down there and just met him down yonder about halfway up the driveway. And they begin to hug. That's what the Lord will do to you tonight. That's what the Lord will do to you tonight. You don't even have to wait till you get to the altar. If you'll take one step out tonight, He'll meet you in the aisle. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He'll meet you. He'll help you. He'll meet you before you ever get out here. Lord, if I don't shut up, I'm about to shout all over this place. Our Father, brother, refuses not. Come just as you are. Come to the Father. He'll forgive you tonight. Woo! Hallelujah. It's good to be saved. You know what? His daddy hugged him. 
His daddy didn't beat him up and say, you sorry, good for nothing thing. I can't believe the way you're living. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. He just hugged him. Said, everything's all right, son. Took a big ring, put it on his finger, shoes on his feet. And he said, bring forth the best robe. He didn't do like a lot of church members. He didn't say, now, go in there and get one of them second class robes and put on him. He's uh-huh. uh-huh. but he's good as the rest of us. Bring the best robe in the house. Put him in. Put it on him. I'll never forget hearing that story. When I first got saved, I'm telling you this and I'm done. A story. Y'all remember that old apple tree song? I heard preachers preach against stuff like that and say, bless God, that ain't got no gospel in it. And then pre- Some of them preachers get so scriptural, they ain't scriptural. I'm telling you, that song tore me up. It didn't have a lot of gospel in it, but I shouted about every time I heard it. Y'all ever heard the old apple tree story? They said it was a story of a young man. And I'll tell you this, I'm through. That young man said he got in a fight with his mom and daddy, and he said, I'm leaving home, and I don't ever want to see you again. I'll you or something like that. And he went off way out to Texas. And he wasted his life. Went in bars, got drunk, lived it up, wasted it with harlots. And they said... A young man was sitting on a train. That stagecoach train where it was headed back toward the hills of this of the south. And they said an old preacher was sitting on that train. And that old preacher looked over there, and there sat a young man just crying. And the preacher looked over and touched him and said, Son, can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? I'm a minister, and I'd like to help you if I could. He said, Preacher, I've been a wicked man. He said, I literally hit my daddy and cussed my mama. He said, I've been out there living wicked in the bars and in them hell holes I've lived like the devil. But he said, preacher, just a few days ago, God gloriously saved my soul. And he said, I, I, he said, I want to go home. He said, I want to make it right with my mom. I want to make it right with my daddy. And he said, I want him to forgive me. And he said, preacher... I don't know if they're going to let me back home or not. I don't. I don't blame them. And the preacher said, "Well, what are you going to do, son?" He said, "I wrote my mom and daddy a letter." And he said, "Mom, I'm sorry. Dad, I'm sorry. And I want to come home. And I want you to forgive me. And I don't blame you if you won't have me." And he said, "Mom and dad, there's an old apple tree standing out there beside the where our the old home place is." And he said, "Mom." He said, if you'll forgive me, he said, if you will forgive me, Mom, he said, I want you to just take a, a rag and tie it on the limb of the old tree. And he said, I'll look when the train comes through. And he said, if that apple tree's got that white rag hanging on it, then I'll know that I can get off and you'll have me. But he said, if there ain't no rag hanging on that limb, I'll just go on and find me somewhere else to live. And the preacher said, Son, what do you think is going to happen? He said, I don't know if they'll have me or not. He said, I don't know my mom and daddy. He said, Preacher, it's right up around the next curve here and I can't even stand to look. Preacher patted him on the knee and said, That's all right, young man. I'll pray for you. That train come around through there and come around that last curve. And he said, Preacher, I can't look. I can't look. I don't know what I'll do. I don't know where I'll go if mom and daddy won't have me. If there ain't no, no rag tied on the limbs of the apple tree, what am I going to do? Is that train come around that curve? That boy said, I can't stand it. And he looked down like that. And that old preacher looked out. And the sight he saw made him down. He punched him. He said, Son, look, 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 look. And that boy opened his eyes and he looked. And he said, that white rag's tied all over that apple tree. He said, there's all over that place. There's waving in the wind. And he said, there's an old white-headed mom and daddy standing out there waving. Like this right here. My boys come home. My boys come home. My boys come home. And he got off and they made up. And he got back right with his parents. He was a prodigal son, but he come home. We see a gracious reception. The Lord wants you to do that tonight. The Lord wants you to do that tonight. You know what I believe? Come on, Miss Desi. I believe these people in here tonight just faking it. And you acting like you're right. 
but you know you're not doing what you ought to do. Play softly. Deep down in your heart, you know the answer to your problem. Come back to the Father. She's playing softly.